When the disciples heard the sound of their names being called by Jesus, they recognized him. As he had once said, he was their shepherd and they knew his voice. But he also said he had other sheep who didn't belong to the fold, but who would also listen to his voice. And he said, those sheep needed to be brought in so that they could all be one flock under one shepherd. Well, after Jesus' ascension, his disciples would be responsible for this work, which they would do by bearing witness to his love, not only in their homeland of Judea, but also in the neighboring land of Samaria, and even to the ends of the earth. Now, the book of Acts, which is the sequel to Jesus' story, introduces a new character. It's called the Holy Spirit, sent by Jesus to lead the disciples in this work. And the Holy Spirit is a lot like Jesus, powerful, unpredictable, and totally unwilling to conform to many of the usual rules about how things are supposed to work. Let's consider this story from Acts chapter 8, verses 26 through 39. Here it is as told in the language of the Common English Bible. An angel from the Lord spoke to Philip, At noon take the road that leads from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert road. So he did. Meanwhile, an Ethiopian man was on his way home from Jerusalem, where he had come to worship. He was a eunuch and an official responsible for the entire treasury of Kandasi. Kandasi is the title given to the Ethiopian queen. He was reading the prophet Isaiah while sitting in his carriage. The spirit told Philip, approach this carriage and stay with it. Running up to the carriage, Philip heard the man reading the prophet Isaiah. He asked, do you really understand what you are reading? The man replied, without someone to guide me, how could I? Then he invited Philip to climb up and sit with him. This was the passage of scripture he was reading. Like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he didn't open his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was taken away from him. Who can tell the story of his descendants? Because his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, tell me about whom does the prophet say this? Is he talking about himself or someone else? Starting with that passage, Philip proclaimed the good news about Jesus to him. As they went down the road, they came to some water. The eunuch said, look, water, what would keep me from being baptized? He ordered that the carriage halt. Both Philip and the eunuch went down to the water where Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Lord's Spirit suddenly took Philip away. The eunuch never saw him again, but went on his way rejoicing. Talk about a sheep from another fold. It is hard to know where to begin in describing this man's otherness. Let's start with geography. He hailed from Ethiopia. This was literally the southern end of the earth from the limited geographical perspective held by Middle Easterners in the first century. Their world maps typically included Egypt, but not much of Sub-Saharan Africa, maybe just the very northern slice of Ethiopia, if that. The Spirit seemed bound and determined to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ to the ends of the earth as literally as that could be understood. So, the guy is from Ethiopia, which brings up another difference, his race. Now, Jesus and his apostles were certainly not the fair-skinned Europeans depicted in the illustrated children's Bible some of us grew up with, but this man's skin would have been many shades darker than their olive complexion. He was definitely not the boy next door for Philip. And while their racial differences may not have been a big deal, there was this one other thing that was. He was a eunuch a man, but without all the usual aspects of maleness. He probably had a boyish, maybe even womanly voice, was beardless, maybe even had a fleshier face and body than a typical man. He'd either been born that way, or he might have been castrated before puberty so that he could serve among the women in the royal court. Intact men were considered too great a threat to the king's harem and the integrity of the royal line, so males working with the royal women had to be eunuchs. Now, maybe that wasn't such a bad life. He did manage the finances of the queen. He was wealthy enough to own a scroll of scripture. He even had access to a chariot. But what he didn't have access to was worship in the temple. 
Now we know he was coming from Jerusalem where he had gone to worship, but he was most likely turned away because of a little verse in Deuteronomy chapter 23, which says that castrated males must not be admitted to the assembly of the Lord. So as he read the words in his scroll, which told of humiliation and justice denied, could he identify? How humiliating it must feel to be turned away from a community of faith representing the God you love and serve. Those in charge of the rules might have sent him away, but the Holy Spirit pursued him, sending Philip to travel down a wilderness road so that he could chase down that man's chariot and join him. Him of all people, a person whose home didn't fit on the map, whose body didn't fit in at the temple. He was the sheep that needed to be gathered in, and the Spirit sent Philip running after him. And I just love that Philip starts the encounter, not by offering up his impressive credentials as a disciple of the Messiah, but by asking a question. Do you understand what you are reading? Which I do not hear as condescending, but curious. It's an invitation for the stranger to share what he does know or to express what he wants to know. Maybe they can even learn from one another because after all, the best way to understand scripture is to read it in community. This moment is so rich with possibility. Philip is letting the eunuch shape the conversation according to his own understanding. Sounds like a great way to talk about scripture. And I love even more that the Ethiopian eunuch has the humility to admit that he cannot possibly understand scripture without someone to explain it to him. He doesn't know what it means, but he wants to, which may have been what sent him to Jerusalem in the first place. Oh, if only he had been allowed in the temple to hear the scriptures explained. But again, he probably was not. So he asked Philip what he was wondering about. The context of the passage, who is this about? The prophet or someone else? Which is a really good question. One we should always ask when we read scripture, who or what is it even about? And this question is the invitation Philip has graciously been waiting for an acknowledgement that his traveling companion actually wants to talk about scripture. I tell you what, the next time I fly in an airplane, that's the evangelist I want to sit next to. What follows is authentic, non-judgmental evangelism. Philip uses the eunuch's question as a starting point from which he proclaims to him the good news about Jesus. I can imagine the kind of things he might have told him, how Jesus not only talked of God's expansive love but modeled it, pushing back all social and religious boundaries by hanging out with the misfits that were excluded from temple worship, people not unlike this Ethiopian eunuch, and welcoming those people to the table of grace in spite of the purity laws and holiness codes found in scripture, advocating for justice for all people even as they withheld it from him, forgiving them, commissioning his followers to continue loving and caring for each other and the vulnerable, and sending them the same holy and powerful spirit that he had received at the waters of his own baptism. Whatever Philip has said, the eunuch is so moved that he points to some water on the side of the road asking, what is to prevent me from being baptized? Indeed, there is nothing to keep him out of that desert oasis, the makeshift baptismal font, where no one is standing guard to keep the likes of him away. He jumps in to find that the waters of God's grace, the love of Jesus Christ, and the power of the Holy Spirit are for him too. And he goes on his way rejoicing. He would never see Philip again, but he wouldn't need to. Guided by his new traveling companion, the Holy Spirit, he would bring the story of Jesus all the way to Ethiopia, where Jesus has been known and followed ever since. Was this man an unlikely missionary? Perhaps, but God has always filled the big roles with little people as if to say, look, I am at work in the lives of those deemed unimportant or unworthy because they are worthy and important to me, and you are to all of you. The God who was pleased to dwell in the body of a humble carpenter from Nazareth, who in turn called into ministry a handful of fishermen, a despised tax collector, an anti-empire liberationist, and a few other people who may or may not even have had real jobs, 
That is the God who would chase down all the lost and scattered sheep, even a first century Ethiopian eunuch. Whom might God be chasing after today? Who are the people not sitting at the table of grace? And what should be our response to that as people of faith? Would we, like the strictest religious authorities of Jesus' time, open our rule books to show them why they are unwelcome? Or would we, like Philip, run after them to find out what it is they are seeking and then show them the gracious welcome that they crave? In her beautiful book called Searching for Sunday, the late Rachel Held Evans tells the story of a young bride who had married into a devoutly religious family who asked her at every opportunity whether she had accepted Jesus as her personal savior. Now, put off by a question that she found intrusive, she dismissed their inquiries until, worn down by the relentless questioning, she finally told them what they wanted to hear. Yes. Oh, that's wonderful, they told her. Now you can come to church with us. Because finally, she reflected back at them their own image, the kind of person they would want to sit next to in worship. And if these folks weren't willing to invite their daughter-in-law to church with them because her theology didn't reflect theirs, whom else might they exclude? The thing is, if we are to take Jesus at his word, then no one can be left out of the fold, not a first century Ethiopian eunuch, but also not a 21st century gender fluid person of mixed race with questionable immigration status. Not even you and not even me, despite all the things that deep down we suspect might be wrong with us, no one can ever be excluded if we are willing to follow Jesus, no matter how we or anyone else might interpret the rules. The only rules Jesus left unchallenged were the ones that supported the essence of the law, to love God and to love neighbor. And so in a world determined to find reasons to hate, it seems to me that we might be better ambassadors of Jesus' teachings if we would model love, not the pretend love that condescendingly invites others with the goal of remaking them in our likeness, but authentic love that jumps into the seat besides the other, asks what you're reading, and allows the transformation to work both ways. Because on the road between Jerusalem and Gaza, I think both men in our story learned something life-changing. An Ethiopian eunuch heard about the great love of Jesus Christ, and a Hellenic Jew named Philip learned just how expansive that love could really be. It's a love that goes further than the ends of the earth, deeper than the pigment of the skin, and wider than our narrow views of worthiness. It is the love of the Good Shepherd who insisted that all should be part of the flock. So our job as disciples is to gather everyone in and to make sure that no one and no thing will stop anyone from knowing and proclaiming the love and welcome of Jesus. May the wide-armed embrace of the Good Shepherd gather us all in.